welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 109, The Star Players, Kemp, Allen and Burbage. Last time, playwright Thomas Decker filled the Elizabethan and Jacobean stages with his diverse and copious output. The playwrights fed the public thirst for new plays at an incredible rate and, as I've noted before, the players had to learn and hold multiple roles in their heads as the theatrical offerings changed on an almost daily basis. There can be no doubt that the players played a large part in the success of the playhouses. I've already discussed the players in terms of the troops, but not so much as individuals. And there is a problem here. We know the names of certainly tens of actors, maybe hundreds, but most of those records are simply a name, with a little or no other detail attached to them. None of the players have what we might consider a well-documented life, but we do know that there were some real stars of the day, and a little about them. Once again, we have to deal with some inference and some stories that may be apocryphal, but I'm going to try to piece together as best I can a story of the life of the three greatest players of their time. As we move on with the story of theatre, the information about actors and how they lived, loved, fought and triumphed does get better. In fact, in some cases, they provide the best of the theatrical stories. But we're not quite there yet. So, for now, I can only tell you a little about these three greats and ask you to remember that behind them, working alongside them, was a gallery of players who were just as dedicated to their art and the life of the playhouse, but lacked that mysterious something. The talent, charisma and good fortune that elevated the best above the rest. And it is not insignificant that we start to hear about great players just as soon as we hear about the rise of the public theatre itself. Will Kemp was one of the earliest actors we know a little about, But even he was working in the shadow of a near predecessor, the comic actor and court favourite Richard Tarleton. So, before we get to Kemp, here is a little on Richard Tarleton. His date of birth and family history is unknown, and he first comes into the record as an original member of the Queen's Men when it was formed in 1583. Prior to this, there's a tradition that says that he was a London apprentice, working as a swineherd or a water carrier. If that's true, then he must have been very happy that a talent for comedy in him was spotted. Tradition has it that it was the Earl of Leicester, then a favourite of the Queen, who recommended him to her. He soon became known for his ability to joke, to jest and ad lib, all in a comic manner, and composed jigs, which at the time were described as rhymed farces sung and danced to traditional airs. He became particularly well known for his ability to tackle hecklers by composing rhyming off-the-cuff riposts. He commanded the craft of improvised doggerel so well that the style became popularly known as Tarleton's for a while. Tarleton seems to have been able to take the traditional elements of the comedy of the medieval stage, the Lord of Misrule, the minstrel and some of the allegorical characters, and update them to his own time. Combined with the rapport he had with an audience and the admiration of the Queen, he was the undisputed king of comedy in his time. He is regularly mentioned by contemporary playwrights, Nash, Decker and Johnson amongst them, in admiring tones, and he is said to have been in Shakespeare's mind when he created the backstory for the deceased court jester Yorick in Hamlet. He was also a playwright in his own right, but his play The Seven Deadly Sins, written in 1585, hasn't survived. He became so famous that after his death in September 1588, a volume of jokes and tall tales, all attributed to him, was published as Tarleton's Jests. Like other successful actors of the time, he became wealthy and elevated his social position. In his will, he referred to himself as a groom of the Queen Majesty's chamber. But also, it is said by his son that he had gambled away any fortune that he had earned. Most significantly for us, he became a model for the comic actors that followed. As his epitaph says, He of clowns to learn still sought, but now they learn of him that they taught. 
In the public view, Tarleton was soon replaced after his death by Will Kemp, comic actor for first the Earl of Leicester's men and then the Lord Chamberlain's men, where he became closely associated with Shakespeare's work. He's thought to have been born about 1560 and possibly to the branch of a wealthy Catholic family in Kent. None of that is proven, and he first turns up reliably in the record in May 1585 as a member of the Earl of Leicester's company. When the Earl was sent to command forces in the Netherlands, Kemp was one of the entertainers who travelled with him. When he was dispatched back to England, he was given letters to carry and deliver, being described in his instructions as Will, my Lord Leicester's jesting player. After a brief stop back home, He then became part of a playing troupe who travelled to the royal court of Elsinore, Denmark, where they entertained the king, Frederick II. After his return to England, there are few records of his activity, but given that Thomas Nash dedicated his 1590 work, An Armand for a Parrot, to Kemp, calling him Vice-Gerent General to the Ghost of Dick Tarleton, it seems safe to assume that he was regularly performing to some acclaim in London and maybe on tour through the 1580s. Similarly, the 1594 quarto edition of the 1592 play A Knack to Know a Knave highlights Kemp's involvement. The title page calls the play a most pleasant and merry new comedy, newly set forth as it has been performed by Ed Allen and his company, with Kemp's applauded merriments of the men of Gotham in refusing the king into Gotham. Now, you might remember The Fools of Gotham from season three of the podcast. It was a well-known tale that was dramatised by travelling players in the medieval period. The story is of a shepherd who is on his way to market, when a man on a bridge tells him that he will not allow him to pass when he returns with his purchased sheep. The two men quarrel, as if they already had the sheep, until a third man arrives. In an attempt to mediate the quarrel, he empties a bag of feed into the river, to show that the two men have as much sense as he now has feed in his sack. The story was designed to question wisdom and folly. After all, in this case, the man who presents himself as the wisest of the three has lost the most. The legend originates from around the early 13th century, when the villagers of Gotham feigned stupidity to dissuade King John from visiting during his royal progress, as the expense involved in such a visit would have ruined the village and left the residents starving. It was one of a number of tales of the seemingly pointless and particularly stupid undertaking of the villagers, which, by the way, was successful. When the king heard the strange antics of the village from his messengers, he decided to go elsewhere. The story had been revived in printed editions in the 1540s, so it was probably an updated version of the story that Kemp was retelling as part of A Knack to Know a Knave. The prominence of Kemp's name on the title page suggests that, as far as the printer was concerned, Kemp's contribution to the success of the play was as significant as Edward Allen's. And a great success it was. Henslow recalls the play being performed at the Rose on the 10th of June 1592, with takings of £3.12, and shillings, one of the highest receipts ever recorded in his diary, and performances were repeated regularly for the next couple of years. Unfortunately, in the printed script, Kemp's contribution is not well recorded. The only surviving copy is probably of a reconstructed memorial script and far from complete. Kemp's scenes are introduced with the stage direction Enter the Mad Men of Gotham, to wit, a miller, a cobbler and a smith, followed by some stage dialogue. But this is very short, as is the printed play as a whole, so it's assumed that Kemp extemporised the comic scenes. By 1592, Kemp was playing with Lord Strang's men. He's mentioned in a document issued by the Privy Council that gave the troop permission to travel to perform outside of London. Two years later, when Lord Strang's men broke up, he joined Shakespeare and Burbage in the move to the Lord Chamberlain's men. He stayed there for four years, but then left in circumstances that have remained mysterious. Although he's mentioned as a proposed sharer for the Globe, which opened in mid-1599, he's never recorded as playing there. There's a hint that the parting of the ways was acrimonious. Kemp was associated with the early Shakespearean comic roles, and with Falstaff in particular, 
So much has been read into the fact that Falstaff does not make a return in Henry V. The fact of his offstage death being merely reported to the new king. It was probably the play that opened the globe, and perhaps any role that there had been for Falstaff in that play was removed and quickly expunged. Also, there is Hamlet's cutting jibe at improvising clowns as he discusses acting with the players, another scene that has been judged by some to indicate some bad feeling between Shakespeare and his one-time comic actor. Perhaps the playwright, now in a powerful position in the theatrical hierarchy, got fed up with Kemp improvising away from his crafted verse. But this is pure speculation, based on those two comments about Henry V and Hamlet. And Kemp's departure from the Lord Chamberlain's men didn't mean an end to performing. An important element of the comic player's persona and talent was the jig, still a comic improvisation to music as it had been in Tarleton's day. The stationer's register indicates that five of Kemp's jigs were published and two of these survive. In early 1600 he undertook to dance from London to Norwich, a distance of some 110 miles. He completed the journey in nine days, but spread over a two-month period. It's said that wherever he went, he was met with happy crowds who cheered him on and, in some cases, joined him for short sections of his dance. He later called this his nine-day wonder, when he wrote a pamphlet describing the experience in an attempt to silence some who did not believe that he had completed the journey. And that was important, because it was said that he undertook this rather bizarre challenge as a wager. His activities after completing that journey are rather opaque. He may have made another European tour, getting as far as Italy, but in 1601 he was back in England and borrowing money from Philip Henslow, and was a member of the Earl of Worcester's men. Two years later, the parish records in Southwark record the burial of a William Kemp, which, although not conclusively referring to the actor, is generally taken to be the date of his death. Edward Allen was considered one of the finest, if not the finest, actor of the Shakespearean generation. His only contender for that title was Richard Burbage, but unlike Burbage, he was not from an acting family. His father was a London innkeeper, with premises in the Bishopsgate district of London, and was also a porter to the royal household. His mother Margaret seems to have had some connection to the Townley family of Lancashire, the same family who were owners of the manuscript for the medieval Wakefield Cycle plays. But the connection is unclear, as she doesn't appear on any official family trees. However, her connection with a grand family and his father's position with the royal household does suggest that the family were doing very well, and would have been prominent in their local society, of their part of London at least, and maybe further afield too. Edward's baptism is recorded in St. Botolph's Parish Register on the 2nd of September 1566, the day after his birth. He was the youngest of four sons and named after his father. Edward Sr. died when his youngest son was just four years old and his widow then married an actor called Brown. From then we find no trace of Edward in the record until he turns up acting in his late teens when he became a member of the Earl of Worcester's men. Now the assumption is that he caught the acting bug from his stepfather and proved a natural talent. The Earl of Worcester's men toured the provinces in 1584 and 1585, a circuit that included towns as far away from London as Shakespeare's hometown of Stratford-upon-Avon. The troupe are recorded appearing there several times. But Alan was young and restless, or maybe just ambitious and confident, and he left the troupe and travelled to London with the express intent of furthering his career. It seems that his confidence was well-founded and he quickly joined the Admiral's men and was soon their principal actor. As you know, the Admiral's men was formed sometime before 1577 where they are first recorded performing for their patron, Charles Howard, 1st Earl of Nottingham, before Howard became Lord Admiral under Elizabeth I and they changed their name to reflect this promotion and took up residence in London. As you have also heard before, Allen played the lead roles in the major Marlowe plays, Tamburlaine, Dr Faustus and the Jew of Malta. 
It's thought that Marlowe wrote those roles with him in mind, and Alan certainly created them on stage for the first time. His fame spread quickly, and Ben Jonson spoke of his power as an actor when he wrote, If Rome, so great and in her wisest age, feared not to boast the glories of her stage, as skilful Rosius and grave Aesop, men yet crowned with honours as with riches then, who had no lesser trumpet to their name than Cicero, whose every breath was fame. How can so great example die in me, that, Alan's, I should pause to publish thee, who both their graces in thyself hath more outstripped than they did all that went before? And present worth in all dost so contract, as others speak, but only thou dost act. Where this renown, tis just, that did give so many poets life, but one should live. Unfortunately, there is little evidence for the other roles that he took on, although they must have been many, and his name is frequently given prominence on printed editions that have survived. He married Philip Henslow's stepdaughter Joan in October 1592. As Henslow's son-in-law, he became part owner in Henslow's businesses and managed the theatre schedules and production details while Henslow cared for its finances. At the Rose Playhouse, the company was having a very successful time, until it was cut short in spring 1593 as the plague returned to the city. With the enforced closure of the theatres, Allen led the troupe into the provinces on tour. It was during performances in Chelmsford that Allen heard bad news from his wife by letter from her, and in reply wrote to her as follows. My good sweetheart and loving mouse, I send thee a thousand commendations, wishing thee as well as may be, and hoping thou art in good health, which I pray God to continue with us in the country, and with you in London. But, Mouse, I little thought to hear that which I hear by you now, for it is well known, they say, that you were by my Lord Mayor's officer made to ride a cart, you and all your fellows, which I am sorry to know. But you may think that your two supporters, your strong legs, I mean, that would not carry you away, but let you fall into the hands of such termagants. But, Mouse, when I come home, I'll be revenged on then. Till when, I prithee, send me word how thou dost, and do my hearty commendations to my father, mother, and sister, and to thine own self. And so, sweetheart, the Lord bless thee. From Chelmsford, the 2nd of May, 1593. Thine ever, and nobody else's, by God of heaven, Edward. The endearments are very touching, but what's going on here? It seems that some of the troops stayed in London, were caught giving a performance in contravention of the recent edict, and Joan was present. There's no indication that she was illegally performing, possibly she was fulfilling a support or backstage role, or even just caught up as an outsider to the group. Perhaps she was there to keep an eye on things for her husband and father. Riding in the cart, by the order of the Lord Mayor's office, suggests that the troop were literally carted off, maybe even punished. The term termagant in medieval times meant an imagined deity who was violent and unpredictable. As a character, it often appeared in morality plays, so Alan clearly thinks that his wife had harsh treatment. The travelling admiral's men returned to London towards the end of 1593, once the plague had abated. Some scholars suggest that the return was premature and the troop were putting themselves at risk by returning to the capital at that point, lured back by a combination of poor receipts in the country, even out of town there was presumably a fear of gatherings that could spread the contagion, the expense of touring, or, maybe, the promise of the London playhouses reopening soon. Whatever the case, at this point, they had their best years at the Rose Theatre. In 1597, Alan and Joan left London and journeyed to Sussex, where he would later buy a large estate. Alan seems to have preferred the role of theatre manager to actor and retired from the stage in 1598. A return was continually requested from his fans, but he resisted until Queen Elizabeth herself requested a performance. That was not the sort of request that anyone could refuse, and after this, Alan continued to make occasional returns to acting, but his main focus was now on business. In early 1600, in partnership with Henslow, he commenced building a new theatre, The Fortune. As I recounted in the earlier episode on the London Playhouses, 
They employed carpenters Peter Street, who had spent the previous year building the globe. They also took out licences and leases for grounds nearby, for bear baiting and other entertainments. You'll remember that he is mentioned in context of Henslow's appointment as the master of games of bears, bulls and dogs. Like his father-in-law, Allen had become an entertainment entrepreneur, but still also involved in a practical way. He's recorded as directing these animal sports in person, and one account says that he personally baited a lion for the entertainment of James I. His acting career had finally come to a complete end with the death of Elizabeth on the 29th of March in 1603. Clearly it was only her requests that had kept him on the stage, and as soon as she was gone, he voluntarily ended his playing career. A popular actor in the period could make a good living, and be accepted into high society, and Alan was no exception. After 1613, there is evidence that his business activities and popularity as an actor gave him a very comfortable lifestyle. But even earlier than that, he had wealth. In 1605, he bought a manor in Dulwich, south of the City of London, for the huge sum of £35,000. He planned to create a hospital and educational college on the plot of land, but it was not until 1619 that he was able to acquire the right permissions to do so. By then, he was the town's most celebrated resident. His God's Gift College is the direct ancestor of Dulwich College, which still exists today. It was said in Aubrey's Brief Lives that Alan was prompted to found the college after a spiritual experience. Aubrey is not the most reliable reporter of real events, tending to like a good bit of gossip rather too much, but nevertheless, of Alan he says, Mr Alan, being a tragedian and one of the original actors in many of the celebrated Shakespeare plays, in one of which he played a demon with six others, Surprised by an apparition of the devil, which so worked on his fancy that he made a vow, which he performed at this place. He is there, of course, referring to the college. In other places, not least in this podcast, that story is related as pertaining to Marlowe's Dr Faustus, not any of Shakespeare's plays, which seems much more plausible. Whatever the case, the college was and is a fine memorial to Allen. He remained closely involved with the school and often visited, sometimes treating the boys to a performance and encouraging them to present plays themselves. On June 28, 1623, his wife Joan died and was buried in the grounds of the college. Theirs had been a long and happy marriage, and Alan was by all accounts lost in grief. He found support in a family friend, Constance Dunn, daughter of the Dean of St Paul's, the poet John Dunn. They soon became attached and married in December 1623, when he was 58 and she was 20. At the end of 1626, Alan went on a business trip to Yorkshire. On the journey, he caught a chill and fearing that he wouldn't survive, he amended his will. He died on the 21st of November 1626 and was buried in the Dulwich College Chapel. The memorial stone that originally laid over him as part of the church floor was moved outside in 1925, as many thousands of feet had caused much wear and tear on it over the years. Thomas Nash praised Allen in his 1593 prose satire Pierce Penniless, and playwright Thomas Hayward called him the best of actors and inimitable. Thomas Fuller, writing in the mid 1600s, included Allen in his book Worthies of England where he said his acting brought so to the life that he made any part to become him. Fuller spent his later life in London, so there is every chance that he saw Alan performing, and he's not merely reporting general opinion. But as much as Alan had his admirers, who would argue for his preeminent position amongst players to the death, that position is usually given to Richard Burbage. As the son of theatre builder James and brother to lawyer Cuthbert, and thanks to his close association with Shakespeare and the Lord Chamberlain's men, I've already mentioned him at times. But let's put the whole together with Richard, the actor, as the centre of our attention, just, no doubt, as he would have liked it. Burbage was born in London in 1567. 
There's a long tradition that Burbage Jr. accompanied his father James to the theatre, which was being built when Richard was about nine years old, and became a fixture in the playhouse from a very young age. There's also a suggestion that he was a member of one of the troops of boy players. By the time his father died in 1597, the family also ran the indoor Blackfriars Theatre, but were locked in legal arguments over the lease for the theatre, arguments that would lead to the dismantling of the theatre and its reconstruction as the basis for the globe. As you have already heard, brothers Richard and Cuthbert's audacious plan to move the theatre paid off, and the two brothers remained in business as partners and sharers in theatres throughout their lives. There was never, as far as we can see, any family discord between them. Indeed, they lived and worked close to each other. But it is Richard's acting career that remains of most interest to us. By the 1590s, so when he was still in his 20s, Burbage was acting with the Admiral's men, joined Lord Strang's men in 1592 and then moved to the Earl of Pembroke's men in 1593. The reason for these moves isn't clear, but it's certainly difficult to imagine Edward Allen and Burbage lasting long in the same troop. Both must have had big egos and surely needed to be the unquestioned leading man of the troop. And, in any case, it is his time with Lord Chamberlain's men for which Burbage is best remembered. There he created the roles of Hamlet, Othello, Richard III, Romeo, Macbeth and King Lear for Shakespeare, but of course also took lead roles in other great plays of the time, Johnson's Volpone and The Alchemist, and Webster's The Duchess of Malfi are a few obvious examples. Details about how Burbage acted and what made him special are virtually non-existent, but praise for him was universal, especially after his death. The general idea seems to be that Burbage was what we would now call a character actor, with the ability to slip into different roles, but to make them all believable, however diverse. That suggests he stood out because he avoided the more bombastic end of the acting of the day and could find and show the inner truth of a part. Of course, he benefited from the playwright, and especially Shakespeare, who were exploring the inner workings of character and actions more than had ever been done before on the stage. But these characters needed interpreters, who were skilled in the use of the stage. And Burbage, perhaps due to his long family and personal association with the space of the playhouse, was just the man for the job. Burbage never sought retirement and continued acting late into his life, and must have seen many changes in the theatre as it matured into a popular art form. Let's not forget that he had been intimately involved with the public theatre from very close to its beginnings. And as time passed, he was there for many things. The first rehearsal for Hamlet, when Romeo first thought Juliet dead, when King Lear first plucked at his beard, when the Lord Chamberlain's company became reconstructed as the King's Men under James I, and then he was on stage as the globe caught fire and was raised to the ground. Then he saw Alan and Shakespeare seek semi-retirement in the country, and, in the latter's case, a premature death, just three years before his own. That must have been hard for him. He had named his son William after his friend and close collaborator. He was in his early fifties when he died, but still more popular than any up-and-coming young actors. There is every indication that he remained the biggest draw to a theatre crowd and was idolised in his lifetime. As I've mentioned before, he died just 10 days after James's wife, Queen Anne, and the outpouring of grief at his death threatened to overshadow the official mourning for her passing. Thomas Middleton wrote an elegy called On the Death of That Great Master of His Art and Quality Painting and Playing, R. Burbage, in which he said, Hung be the heavens with black, yield the day to night. And then, Burbage the player has vouchsafed to die, therefore in London is not one eye dry. The deaths of men who act our queens and kings are now more mourned than the real things. The queen is dead. To him know what are queens. Queens of the theatre are much more worth. Dick Burbage was their mortal god on earth. When he expires low, all lament the man. But where's the grief that should follow good Queen Anne? For many, the loss was very personal. 
The Earl of Pembroke was due to go to the theatre, but he had to excuse himself as he recorded later. My Lord Lennox made a good supper to the French ambassador this night here, and even now all the company are at the play, which I, being tender-hearted, could not endure to see so soon after the loss of my old acquaintance Burbage. Richard Burbage was buried in Shoreditch, in a graveyard close to the site of the theatre and the curtain, and his gravestone was said simply to have read, Exit Burbage. One hundred years on and his prowess on stage still resonated. A memorial was put up to remember Burbage and his brothers. An anonymous poet wrote a funeral elegy on the death of the famous actor Richard Burbage, who died on Saturday in Lent, 13th of March, 1619. It's a very long elegy and I have quoted it before, but I think the most striking parts bear repeating. It reads, He is gone. And with him what a world are dead, which he reviewed to be revived so no more. Young Hamlet, old Hieronimo, King Lear, the grieved more and more beside, that lived in him have now for ever died. It's a real shame that there are no more details about the players of the Elizabethan Playhouse. There is, I'm sure, much more that we could learn about the early performances of these plays if only we had more details from the player's perspective. The details we have, about the likes of Kemp, Allen and Burbage, suggest that the charismatic actor was a feature of theatre as much as it was in Roman times and on the European continent, and as it still is today. But then no one seems to have had the idea that the life of the player and their insights into their art might have been interesting to record. Playing was seen as a transient entertainment, and it seems that we are lucky to even have the small percentage of printed plays that we do have. But there will still be the odd occasion when the voice and personality of a player will come through, so we're not quite done with the players yet. Next time, I'm going to try to bring together what we know about the playhouses and the players and look into the stage conventions of the time and thereby, hopefully, get a better understanding of the acting style and how the playwrights used those conventions to best effect. In the meantime, please join the Facebook page or group or find the podcast on Instagram or X to keep up to date with new episodes and other theatre-related stuff. You can find details of ways to support the podcast at the website, which is www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. If you do feel able to help out with the costs of running the podcast, then please head over to Patreon, where you will find additional content for a small monthly fee or a one-off donation. And you could also make a one-off donation at ko-fi.com. You can also find the details about that on the website and in the links in the show notes. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via x at thoetp. (laughs) 